it's interesting right now that, w extraordinarily enough, in a, in, a, in a United Kingdom, famous perhaps, yes, famous for, uh, well, what should we say? Historically famous, is what's Britain famous for? It's famous for mediocrity, it's famous for dithering, it's, uh, it, it's, it's famous for lack of commitment. That extraordinarily enough, right now, the United Kingdom is seen around the world as some kind of exemplar because it's a country which is committed to an 80% reduction in, in, in carbon emissions by 2050. Now, that's a kind of really hefty commitment. Suddenly, we've stolen the thunder from under the rug of Germany and the Netherlands and, um, and, and uh, Scandinavia. And the world is looking to us somehow as, uh, as the example of what to do next. No, I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Because, after all, this country was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. And I personally believe we have something of a moral obligation to demonstrate to the rest of the world what the um, post-Industrial Revolution will be and the Sustainable Revolution, what that will be. So um, I think it's a fantastic challenge. And uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Wales. We're very lucky to have Jane, specifically as Minister, driving um, some extraordinary innovative schemes here in, in, in Wales, and, uh, and believe me, there aren't that many across Britain, and actually surprisingly few across even Europe. So um, I'm now going to spend the usual ritual 30 seconds asking how I um, move the PowerPoint on. Oh, look, there we are. <laughs> this is HAB. Um, this is the business I started about six years ago with the intention of completing our first housing project three years ago. Still waiting. Uh, that's, it's coming soon. Um, it stands for Happiness, Architecture and Beauty. Uh, we could have called it Sustainability, Happiness, Architecture and Beauty, but that would have spelled shab. So <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to build shabby housing. Um, and I'll talk a little bit shortly about the things that we hold dear as a business. But first of all, I just want to talk to you briefly about this issue of what eco-housing is and, and why we need it and, um, and what drives us in our business uh, to, to do what we do. And it's this. It's the fact that uh, we currently occupy this small sphere in a corner of the universe. Um, without us on it, this small sphere would just be another little mote of dust. But it's very, very important to us. Um, sadly, we've only got one. Uh, despite the fact that if the entire global population of 7 billion were living to the standards that we enjoy in this part of the world, uh, we'd need three planets. Sadly, we don't have three. As a friend of mine who runs by a regional charity said, um, there is no planet B, uh, <laughs> but, or C for that matter. The good news is that if we, were, um, if we were living in America, we'd need five planets, but we don't it doesn't get around the problem that we do not have quite enough resources for us to get by and for generations that follow us to get by. The population expands, the resources remain finite, and global standards of living and global consumption patterns increase. So, what I love about this, this little philosophy called One Planet Living is it sets out some very, very understandable objectives about how we should be working in tandem with the resources we've got. So it sets as its first objective, zero carbon. You'll be familiar with many of these. There are seven here. Zero carbon, <coughs> zero waste. After all, you know, if resources are scarce and thin and expensive, why, why would we waste them? Why would we throw stuff away when there is? No, away. Why would we happily gobble through materials and jettison them when we can easily and happily renewable, uh, re re reuse them. Sustainable transport, big objective. Uh, local and sustainable materials in everything from what? Um, houses to trainers and jeans, perhaps. Local and sustainable food and inroad, which many actually local authorities and organizations are now making. So you, for example, it's, it's quite difficult now to get to any part of this country and not find a local farm selling local produce. Within 10 years, we've gone from uh, buying entirely everything at supermarkets to local farmers' markets now to farm shops to farm shops rivaling the supermarkets <coughs> on local turfs. Uh, sustainable water. Well, of course, in many countries these days, water's traded at commodity prices higher than that of oil. 
and uh, natural habitats and wildlife, the idea of biodiversity, maintaining all the time at a, at a, at a period when species are disappearing off the planet at a phenomenal rate, maintaining uh, our relationship and our respect for the ecosystems of the planet. Now, why would you do that? Why would you want to uh, respect uh, the habitats of polar bears? Why not just let the polar ice cap melt? Why not see the tigers, the pandas, and the, the rhinos disappear? Hmm? Well, it's because, of course, they form part of an ecosystem on which we depend, our timber and our fish and our, our foodstuffs and our oxygen, and most of the resources we use tend to depend themselves on uh, an ecosystem continuum and not being threatened. Um, otherwise, the entire planet's going to end up looking like this. Uh, and why? Well, fundamentally, as I mentioned before, we, it's to do with patterns of consumption, but there is one unfortunate truth underlying, um, underlying consumption of goods in the world and consumption of materials, and that's this. There are just a great deal of us, and that number is increasing. Um, the book I've written about is a book about, um, it's a book about the S-word, but I don't use the S-word very much. It's difficult to talk about sustainability in as much as it's difficult to talk about beauty as an abstract concept. Life can be more or less sustainable. The fact that we're all sitting here breathing means that um, we're, we're, we're pumping out carbon dioxide. We're, we're using resources. We're using the heat in this building, the light. You all had lunch, I hope. And you all have supper. And, and you all go out tomorrow and buy something. And without even trying, we have an impact on the planet. It's a question really of how, sust how increasingly sustainable that is, more sustainable or less sustainable. <coughs> Um, and um, in this book, I, I, I tackle this issue of, of, of population. Uh, I went to Mumbai a couple of years ago, well, 18 months ago, to film there um, and to live in, in amongst the people who live in a million people in one square mile in the slums of Mumbai in Dalovi. And um, it, was, it was became pretty apparent to me that uh, people can get by in a lot less than the, than the amount of stuff that we consume in the West. Now... Um, I mentioned before seven <coughs> principles which would be all familiar to you, but here are three more that make up the ten objectives of One Planet Living. Culture and heritage, equity and fair trade, health and happiness. Now, without thinking about it too much, you'll realise that those last three points are all to do with this species here. <laughs> not the pandas and not the polar bears, but human beings, because in the end, this, this, the one species whose continued survival is threatened, of course, is us. And so One Planet Living takes human beings at its <coughs> core, at its centre. And um, it's interesting, I keep coming back to the Brundtland definition of sustainability, which was that one set out um, in 1987 by the Brundtland Commission. And what they said was, uh, sustainable development is that which which meets and services the needs of the existing generation, but without compromising the needs of future generations. It's about people. It puts human beings and our survival and our happiness, our culture, our heritage and our health at the centre of environmentalism. So on the subject of uh, happiness and uh, environmentalism, um, I thought I'd show you just a few pictures of some, uh, some eco-vehicles. Um, so I'm going to ask you, ask you, uh, I, I, it's a rhetorical question, you don't, don't worry, you don't need to answer. Um, which of the following cars is the eco car? Is it the Range Rover, I think it's the Range Rover Sport, I don't know. Is it the Aston Martin? Is it the, um, the 1982 restored vintage Ferrari with the model posing on top? Uh, is it the Toyota Prius? Is it the Little electric G whiz R. Ah. You see, you can get 25 of those for each Aston Martin. <laughs> or is it this? Just to throw a uh, googly into the mix. Um, well, the, the thing is about the Aston Martin is that 96% of all, and I don't work for Aston Martin, by the way, and they've never paid me any money, but 96% of Aston Martins that have ever been made are still in existence. Um, generally, they're fairly low mileage. They're beautiful pieces of craftsmanship. They're made with extraordinary amounts of love, dedication, and human energy in a factory in the UK. And um, most people that own them drive them at the weekends. 
The Toyota Prius is made in Japan. It's got lithium-ion batteries, which are quite difficult to recycle. And it's a car which is mass-produced in a factory in entirely different circumstances with a much shorter life. Now, the question really is, you know, which is more ecological? Is it the Toyota Prius driver who drives 30 miles a day to and from work? Or is it the Aston Martin owner who's got the Aston Martin at home, who drives at the weekend, who works from an office across the yard from where he lives? Well, of course, in the end, the answer is, about all these vehicles, is that none of them are ecological because they all require enormous amounts of materials and resources to make, and yet they're all ecological. What matters is not the object but us, how we consume and use the objects. To have 16 cars might be considered to be less than ecological. To have one and to drive it 100 miles a day is, to, is less than ecological. It's our behaviour, it's how we behave that determines how sustainable these technologies and these products are. And for, my, for, for what it's worth, I, I sort of think that we have sort of got to the age of the car anyway, and the end of the age of the car anyway, more or less. I think we're witnessing the sort of last great flowering of the automotive industry. A friend of mine said, uh, who's an environmental campaigner, said, we, we're coming to the end of what was the 100-year hydrocarbon experiment where um, we dig all this stuff out of the ground that's been there for 350 million years and we set fire to it uh, just to see what happens. <laughs> and, um, well, now we know what happens, don't we? We know. <laughs> we managed to screw things up. So, what's the ecological house? Uh-huh, trick question. Yeah, it's kind of, you'll recognise this. Is it this? Is it Ben Law's house made from coppice timber, heated with coppice timber, it's a, it's a zero carbon, it's, a sort of, it's it, in environmental terms an invisible home because the timber from which it's built has already regrown. Is it this, a, uh, a 16th century farmhouse which is built from the materials from the fields around it, which has been there for 500 years and which will continue to be shared by future generations, <coughs> but uh, which might run on oil or gas to keep it warm. Is it this, a, a super insulated modern Scottish building in concrete with large cladding that's super insulated with mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, uh, ground source heat pump, all these technologies pumped into it. Which is the eco house? Is it this one? Probably not. <laughs> the point about timber is that you can dig it out of the, off, off the tree. I mean, if, if a tree falls over and dies, it releases carbon dioxide and methane back into the environment. So it actually behoves us all to go out there and chop down trees. We should be chopping down trees all the time and building out of them because that way it locks the carbon in the timber into the thing we're using it for. At the very least, we should be using timber as fuel, uh, but only when we've considered it for other purposes. And certainly what's happening to this building isn't, isn't good for the environment. Is it this? This is a super glamorous development in Holland by S333 Architects. Well, the interesting thing about the... Um, how many architects here, by the way? One? <laughs> uh, architect, how many architecture students, I should say? <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. At least two. Um, the 20th, 20th century was, of course, the century of the, uh, the glass-walled, minimalist, white-painted, Miesian box. International modernism, which sort of grew and flourished in the 1920s across Europe, it took a while to take off in the UK because we were suspicious of all things European uh, and still remain so. Um, and, um, and nevertheless, um, I've been filming quite a lot of people building this kind of nonsense over the past 10 years. Now, the interesting thing about the glass-walled box is that it's only just come of age. For the whole of the 20th century, you could put a glass-walled box anywhere on the planet. You could put it at the North Pole, you could put it in the middle of the Sahara Desert, you could put it in the tropics of Amazonia, and you could put it in Surrey. And wherever you put it, you could control the internal environment for human beings by pumping lots and lots of fossil fuel energy into it. So you could cool it, and you could ventilate it, and you can heat it, and you can make it comfortable for people. It doesn't really matter where it goes on the planet. Um, in the early days of environmental sustainable construction, people would say, no, 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 we don't want that style of building because sustainable homes should be made out of timber. They should look hairy and woolly, and they should be... Um, they should be entirely at one in, in their aesthetic with their environment. I have a slight problem with that because that sort of, in a way, is almost as fascist, it's almost as, as prescriptive as the, the advocates of international modernism. So um, what does an eco-house look like? 
Well, it is now possible, thanks to mechanical ventilation, heat recovery, uh, passive design, and, um, and all kinds of other clever technologies, uh, triple glazing, for example, to build internationally modern architecture and yet make it work in extremely cold environments and, and yet run on minimal amounts of, of fuel inputs. So, for example, this is the... Uh, it's very noisy in Cardiff, isn't it? <laughs> it <coughs> and and this, is, this is the posh end, isn't it? Um, th th this is uh, England's first passive house. I know there are many, many in Wales already, but I'm from England. And this is England's first passive house. It's a, a concrete, semi-buried structure. We filmed it. It was at the beginning of the series of grand designs that's just aired. Um, it's in the Cotswolds. It has triple glazing. Uh, concrete floors, a concrete structure because it's buried into the ground. To all intents and purposes, it's an international modern building, but it has almost zero energy requirements. Mechanically ventilated heat recovery that takes all the heat from the existing internal environment and transfers it to the fresh incoming air. It's quite, it's quite technologized, this building, but it demonstrates that it's possible to do this kind of thing without it looking too hairy. <coughs> so, really, a, a green, a sustainable, an eco building can can look, uh, well, can look however you want it to look. Um, some people would say you can build it out of any material you want to. You can build it out of concrete and steel and glass because actually in use, in use over 50 or years or so, it is the, it is the running costs of the building <coughs> which matter more than the embodied energy in the materials in the building in the first place. Now, I sort of buy into that, um, but I also... Well, I'll come to it in a second. I also think we should be looking at much more innovative materials. Um, what we certainly should be doing is, is answering this question when we build houses. And after all, the, the, talk of, the title of this evening's talk it, it, it is to do with context. Now, um, in terms of how we design and what we build out of, um, the reason I started HAB in the first place was partly a response to, to, to all these questions that One Planet Living throws up about the kind of homes we should be living in. But also, it was in response to this. This is a, a development in um, Gateshead. No, I beg your pardon. No, sorry, sorry. It's in Llandlin, though. No. Um, no, sorry, actually. It's not. It's, um, it's Cornwall. No, it's... Uh, anyway, look. It doesn't really matter, does it? It's everywhere. That's the point. This style of architecture isn't a style. It's a sort of thing which has grown up as a sort of bad copy of a template of a poor quality reproduction of something that was scanned on a photocopier one day 20 years ago by the wife of the MD of a development company. It's horrible. I mean, we, we, we build houses that have no architectural validity, which don't, which don't even belong to a recognisable style, which certainly don't belong recognisably to a place. And my one big beef here is that if you design, if you can design places, buildings, which look as though they belong where they are, then generally people respond to that quite positively. They say, oh, that looks good there, that looks nice. Because architecture is not just about, uh, it's not just about the interior, it's not just about light and space and white emulsion. It's, a, it's about encountering stuff in the public realm every day. We, we don't have any choice about the buildings or the quality of the public realm that we encounter. We have a great deal of choice about art, about music, uh, about sculpture, about literature, things that we can engage with entirely at will. We can put down and walk out of the gallery. But architecture, you can't. <coughs> architecture is there. It's in your public realm. It's in your face all the time. So if you can make architecture fit, if you can make it seem somehow resonant and responsive to where it is, then my argument goes, well, then people like it a bit more. Matt, for that matter, when you design housing that way, people feel that um, they might rather enjoy living there, and for that matter, staying there, and even trying to make a community there, and get to know their neighbours, rather than see a building just as a shell, and just as something to use on the property ladder to move up and, and sell on. Um, this is a architecturally a lovely, very contextual place, which is Swindon, further down the M4 corridor. It's one of a number of towns on the M4 corridor, all of which look like each other. Um, and uh, but Swindon, you can recognise by the, <coughs> the presence of the, um, <coughs> the futuristic tower in the middle of it. Uh, and by, of course, its magic roundabout. <laughs> Look carefully at the sign. Um, 
the magic roundabout, Swindon, by the way, is in the middle of an extraordinary landscape. It's just on the edge of the Cotswolds. It's above the Marlborough Downs. There is, just down the road, Avebury, which is a four and a half thousand year old stone circle. Swindon has its own stone circle. Uh, <laughs> and this is it. And um, when I talk about Swindon, we talk about context. It's something we're very passionate about. Um, I use this photograph next to a picture of Avebury. Because in a way, in a way, Swindon's more famous for this than it is for Avebury. I mean, <coughs> Japanese planners, Russian urban designers, American traffic officers come to Swindon to look at this roundabout. I drove round it last week for the first time properly, and I just want to say to you that, um, I don't know, is this, does it have a pointer? It doesn't. Um, the, the point is that each little mini roundabout here is like an ordinary roundabout. It's, it's uh, clockwise. However, the central roundabout is anti-clockwise. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you can do is you can drive around the outside of this all day, all day. You can take that route. I did this. I did this eight times, which I think is probably illegal, but it was great fun. And at any point you can peel off into the middle. And actually, you can choose which route you take. You've got a number of choices of route into the middle. And once you're in the middle, you can just keep going down the middle. <laughs> Using this principle of reversing the polarity as it clockwise, anti-clockwise, clock, it, it would be possible to build a roundabout of infinite complexity of hundreds of circles, which you could then call Milton Keynes. <laughs> anyway, my point is about this stone circle is that it's, it's as unique and as important to Swindon. People laugh when I say this, but I really believe it. As, as Avebury is to Avebury. It's part of the history of this place. It, it's what makes Swindon. It's what makes it famous. Um, this is also what makes Swindon famous and has made it famous around the world for, um, well, 150 years now, and that is the fact that Great Western Railways, locomotives and carriages were all built there. And they then travelled all around the world, these, these machines. Um, to the extent that there's a huge Sikh population in Swindon, and that that's because the Sikhs in India ran the railways, and when they decided, some of them, to come to the UK, well, where would they go except for Swindon? It had a, the plate on the side of the locomotive said, made in Swindon. Where else would you live if you were a railway worker? Um, so... Um, I talked earlier, I mentioned that, I've dropped into the, into the conversation this little word, context. <coughs> and um, for most architects and designers, context is, a, is, is, is an unexplored term. It sort of usually describes, and in planning terms it's quite clear actually, usually describes the, the, um, the immediate locality of something. So you might talk about, for example, designing a new building to pop into a slot between two existing ones and on the new building, you're choosing a roof the same colour as the ones either side. It's got a, that simple. It's talking about the immediate environmental <coughs> sort of little sets of reference points with which you can then design. Whereas what we like to think of context as is, is something much deeper, much richer, much wider, and in a way much more abstract and fuzzy. So context can be things like the colours of buildings, roofing tiles, and, uh, and local vernacular materials. But context is also, of course the topology, the underlying geology of a place, um, its road systems, its history of use, its, um, its, its folklore as well, its stories, its imagined narratives as well. And we think those are just as important in bringing a place to life. And when you're building a new scheme, when you're trying to sort of create out of nowhere a new place, a new community, or at least provide some kind of fertile ground for a new community, relying on stories, on narrative, on anything you can grab your hands on to help build a place, to make it feel special and distinctive to where it is, <coughs> is absolutely necessary. So these are the railway cottages in Swindon, which are, um, were built by Brunel's office um, in between 1842 and 1845, and they were built for all the engineers and the railway workers who were constructing the trains and the carriages. They're very, very desirable now, uh, many of them are, are offered as social housing. They're one-bedroom houses. They're two up, two down buildings. They're very small. They're like a, an apartment, really, but hugely desired in Swindon, partly because there's nothing else like them. And they have these beautiful little gardens at the front. And there's a sense in living in this place that you are part of something special, are part of some, a, a little community. And um, this is not what we're designing, which is a sort of... Um, 
20th, 21st century equivalent. This is Poundbury, the Prince of Wales' uh, scheme, uh, just outside Dorchester, um, which curiously has an architectural style which finishes somewhere around 1823. Um, and I've never understood quite why. Um, the postcard is from 1823 as well, as you can see. It's sort of f fuzzy and hand-coloured. <laughs> as indeed, I think life in Poundbury is a bit fuzzy and hand-coloured. <laughs> This is what we're building, which is a sort of our attempt at a 21st century reinterpretation of the terraced house. So um, just to give you a, a... This is our first project. We're building uh, two projects in Swindon. We're building uh, two projects in Stroud. And we're also uh, looking at Oxford and uh, one or two other places in, in the, the west of England at the moment. Um, and our schemes are for between anything between uh, 40 and 200 homes, each scheme. And um, what we're trying to do is to design each one to look entirely bespoke and responsive to where it is. We use proper grown-up architects, uh, different practices on each project. And um, we spend a lot of time working out what happens outside the buildings as well as inside. Um, so this is a, this is courtesy of Glenn Howells, our architect. This is a uh, mocked-up version. It doesn't quite look like this yet. Um, but you'll see here recognizably terraced houses, albeit with very large windows. They're quite spacious buildings. We do two, three, and four bedroom homes. Instead of chimneys, we've got uh, <coughs> pass passive um, air cowls on the roof. Uh, we're building these houses out of hemcrete, which is a material which, uh, unlike carbon and steel, uh, unlike uh, steel and um, uh, concrete, is, has a very uh, low uh, carbon uh, embodied energy. In fact, it has a, a carbon positive input into the buildings because uh, the hemp that we grow <coughs> to make these buildings from, uh, mixed with lime, um, is, um, it locks up carbon into the building. Uh, also provides thermal mass, very high insulation values as well. So these are code level four and five homes, and I cannot stress enough that we are building these and this entire scheme for standard housing association budgets. We're building code level four and five homes for, for about £104 a square foot. Um, which means that we can win, gain, and, um, and build out projects at a time when developers find that quite hard. Another view, um, just to really annoy me, the architect's put lots of very expensive cars in the shot. Um, <laughs> he's also put Doctor Who in. As you see, just Doctor Who there, just uh, escaping to find another planet, because he can. And um, well, it might be Jeremy Clarkson, I don't know, uh, heading off in search of another planet. Uh, and, uh, and this is what the scheme looks like right now, which is not so good. Um, actually, this is a, a, a little dated because we've been applying the hemcrete and we've got our infrastructure in now. But it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a difficult site, very low-lying, a bit muddy. So I, I just wanted to run through some of the principles that <coughs> drive uh, what we do al alongside uh, the One Planet Living objectives. Um, essentially, we think that housing should be, after all, it should be enjoyable, Yes, it should be sustainable. Uh, it should also be social. It should be, have architectural input. Uh, it should be contextual. I think you by now know what that word means. And it should be profitable. It should be isn't quite yet. At the moment, it's not exactly the best time to be talking about profits in construction. But um, safe to say that actually we, we, we break even and, and we're, in, we're in business. And, um, and on the subject of, of how we get there, um, we just buy one of these and cut it out. It's easy. Uh, we're working with um, uh, Glenn Howells, with um, Paul Monaghan, AHM, and with Deborah Sort and David Hills, who make DSDHA Architecture. And uh, DSDHA have just won Architect of the Year, and indeed Schools Architect of the Year. So we like to, if we can, strong arm the, uh, the best in the business to come and design social housing for us. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of slightly avoiding the question of how we, how we get to this, uh, this magical world where we can create these kind of sustainable communities and eco-homes, um, when indeed we've already seen that ecological architecture is really what you make of it. And after all, I mean, in Britain, uh, I think we, we have the time on a tradition of controlling our environments in our homes um, by turning up the heating to full and then controlling the ventilation by opening the windows. <laughs> now, that's, that's how traditionally we've always worked. 
Uh, it gets a bit hot. Oh, quick, open the window. It may be February, but just open the window just for a minute. Um, we, 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 we're not very good at managing and controlling and monitoring the way we live. And indeed, uh, that's, that's, that, that's part of where we're going with our projects. I was talking to Jane earlier about this, about how important it is for residents moving into buildings which are properly designed, ecologically designed, that are perhaps different, that, that residents do, uh, do get to understand and are trained in a way how to, how to operate their buildings. <coughs> but the point I'm trying to make here is that what we're doing, and indeed what Jane was referring to earlier, are projects which are being built in a recession which architecturally and in terms of their environmental performance are incredibly successful and yet in a way don't quite deliver what you would call full sustainability certainly <coughs> not one planet living objectives how do you in building houses how can you create sustainable water or or, or su su sustainable transport systems well the answer is actually with architecture you can't what you need is one of these this is our secret weapon this is Luke. Luke is a landscape architect. <coughs> now, for most developers, and most people indeed, landscape architecture is considered the frilly stuff that you do once you've built your housing scheme and you're about to move people in. You lay some turf quickly and plant some trees and dig a hole for a pond, maybe. And that's what landscape architecture <coughs> is. What's really interesting, however, is if you look at what makes places sustainable, what makes traditional communities work, what makes the best European schemes work. It's stuff that happens not inside homes, but outside homes. It's the stuff in between the buildings. And actually, that's where the architecture stops, and for that matter, where the architect's role often stops. What we like to do is to do a lot of design work outside the front door. So uh, for an example on our schemes, and bear in mind that the Swindon scheme we saw earlier is 42 homes, 21 of which are for people from the social housing list, and 21 of which theoretically are for the open market. But there is no open market, so instead what we're doing is we're offering other people off the social housing list the option to do shared ownership or buy to rent <coughs> schemes. So we're trying to make as mixed a local population as possible. We're not trying to simply just bung in loads of people off the housing, housing list because that will just create, frankly, a social housing ghetto. We're trying to make a proper mixed community where Every household, whether you own, part own, you rent to buy, or whether you are on the social housing list, every household has one share in all of that public realm outside the front door. So everybody owns the stuff in between the houses. And thanks to Luke, we have a design which really maximises that. So, for example, um, what we don't have is this. Well, you wouldn't have that, would you, with 42 houses in Swindon? But what we do have is a car club where people share ownership of cars, reduces the vehicle numbers on the street, reduces car ownership, and also increases the cash in people's pockets because uh, membership of a car club works out about a third to a quarter of that of, of owning a car. So instead of having three cars in your family, or even two, you might just have one and then join the car club. Uh, electric scooter club, that's the alternative. And indeed on the Stroud project, and Stroud is very, very hilly, so you can't really persuade people to bicycle everywhere. Um, so we're offering an electric scooter club uh, to help uh, people there. And uh, obviously uh, bicycle, a bicycle share uh, scheme as well. That's, we're putting that into Swindon, and as well as, as bicycle, bicycle storage. Um, there's another piece of technology we're putting into buildings which we've been developing called a shimmy, which is a bit like a sort of home portal. It's a computer meets one of those Watson meters that you can take around the house to see how much electricity you're using, meets the local bus timetable. So instead of having to walk to the bus stop to see when the next bus is coming on your little home portal at home by your front door there's a little panel that tells you just in case you thought of leaving the car at home and catching the bus into the centre of town to do the shopping and um, also in the hands of Luke is a very very complex uh, approach to how we manage water not just um, not just as a resource we're creating water of course we want to be keeping rainwater, uh, recycling grey water, and, and for that matter we're also putting in hand pumps uh, by our kitchen garden so that kids can water, can be paid essentially, slave labour, to water uh, the garden. But also I thought it would be an absolutely brilliant solution for us to have a kids car washing club. Um, so if you want your car washed you pay local children who then have to manually pump water from an underground cistern to wash your car. Zero carbon car wash. Um, very cheap too. Um, 
But um, it's very important, I think, also that we understand as part of our approach to water and its value, what it can be used for, where it comes from, where it goes. That doesn't happen when you simply conduit water down a pipe and it disappears into a huge underground tunnel somewhere under the street. So instead, we like to, first of all, give, up, give, give children an opportunity to play in it and put it down runnels and into reed bed systems and ponds so that people can see water and understand when it rains, what happens to that water, where it might go, what it might get used for. And you'll remember one of the big One Planet uh, objectives is, is local and sustainable food. And as part of that strategy, it's important to encourage people to grow as much stuff as possible. So, for example, on the Swindon scheme, we have uh, vegetable uh, shared <coughs> kitchen gardens, shared kitchen gardens with raised beds, polytunnel, greenhouse, and um, a wheelbarrow. And for that matter, a shed, a shared shed too. Um, Luke has a lovely phrase. Um, he likes to design fruity streets um, with edible hedgerows. And um, indeed, our car park on the Swindon project is itself an orchard. Uh, Swindon Council don't know this. Uh, we, we put in an application to do this, to, to, to be able to park under the trees on, on grass creek paving. And they said, you can't do this because uh, fruit will fall on the cars and people get very annoyed about that. And moreover, fruit is a slip hazard. So we said, yes, OK, fine, we'll put in birches or lime or something else which really annoys people. But we're not going to. We said we're just going to put in some plums and apples and see if they spot it. Um, that local food project, of course, fits, into, um, fits rather scarily and uncomfortably into a new national government agenda of localism, um, whatever that is. Big society, whatever that is. I'm not sure. I think little society is what we've been trying to work out and work on. Um, but certainly anything which encourages people to think locally in terms of resource use, in terms of food growing, in terms of transport, has to be a good thing. It reduces our impact on the wider planet and in increases our understanding of resources and their availability within a place, within the local context. It rains a lot in Swindon, luckily. It doesn't in the east of Anglia. And... Um, of course, um, I, I put this photograph in because it's just a, represents a blatant breach of health and safety. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. I just put it in because it leads me here. Notice the length of the lead. The average power tool in the UK gets used, according to Bioregional, for four <coughs> minutes in its entire life. And so if we could just, just just bring ourselves to buy a power tool and share it with our neighbours. Wouldn't that be a great thing? Wouldn't it be great if between ten houses there was one shed and in that one shed there was a lawnmower and there was a, uh, a drill and a sander and some other tools and outside there were two or three cars and some bicycles. Wouldn't that be great? Do you, there are schemes in Europe that work on that basis. And indeed in Stroud, that's exactly what we're doing. We're asking people to share. Because sharing, it's, very, it's a very, very big word with us, sharing. Sharing, of course, reduces impact. It promotes social contact. It begs of people that they get on, that they don't, that they don't have war with their neighbours. And it creates a little more social cohesion when it works. And it is the sharing in the ownership of land, the sharing in resources, the sharing in transport, the sharing in food production, the sharing in materials and tools that really underscore everything that we try and do. Now, this is a big ask of people, isn't it? Because as a society, we, we're very, very used to living in our, our little worlds, each with our ownership of our cars and our tools and our, 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 our power and our energy. And, and woe betide anybody who's going to try and take this away from us. But actually, if, you're looking, if we're looking at where we're going as a planet, as a species, and as a society for the next 50 years, then we're going to be seeing a lot more of this, a lot more <coughs> shared resources. Because not all of us have got one of these. <laughs> huh? Thank you very much.